uh, next up is, see that we're ready? Okay, so next up is Ophir. He's a senior product manager at uh, JFrog. So go ahead. Hi, guys. Uh, I see that some people are still in the building. Uh, I, I was hoping that all of you will go and I'll be less stressed, but this is what I have. So I'm going to talk about software, liquid software as the security solution for DevSecOps delivery. And I know that it's cryptic. I'll try to explain. I won't try to sell you anything in this session. It's more of a vision. And uh, let's go. So tell me if you've been there. Have you identified a vulnerability in your product and it took you a long time to test it before you could release it to customers? Yes. yes? It's not, not only me. Customers know that you have a vulnerability because it's something totally public and they are pressing to get a solution, but you want to test it before and they are pressing and you want to test it before. Have you been there? Yes. Right. When you, all, when, when you got there and you provided a fix, it was not only a fix for that critical issue, but also other fixes, because it was a part of a bigger patch. Been there? Yeah? And then it took the customers ages to deploy, because they need to wait for the change window. They were pressing very, very hard. And then when you brought it to them, it takes them three months to deploy the patch. Been there? And the worst of all, you provided the patch, and it includes another problem. <laughs> yeah? Yeah, we've all been there. So who am I? Uh, I'm with JFrog. Some people do not know what JFrog is, but when you mentioned Artifactory or Bintray, some people say, oh, we're actually using you. Uh, I'm the product manager for X-Ray, which is our software composition analysis tool. But I won't talk about that here. I have an Instagram not related in anything to <laughs> anything that we're talking about. And the hashtag and the link are related to what I'm going to talk about today. One thing, maybe the reason that I've joined JFrog is the cool shirts that we have. And this is the wall of all of the shirts that have been released throughout the years. So if you want a cool shirt, you can go later on to the booth and get a shirt. Do what I do. I did just fill the survey with fictitious answers and get a shirt. OK, and the second part of who am I is, and I won't talk about all of that, but the idea is that I've been in the industry for quite a long time. And the thing that I'm going to talk about, I've witnessed them uh, on my own flesh, as we are saying. So I've been developing in a lot of programming languages that some of you may not even heard about them, or you've seen them in a movie or in a slide earlier today. But I promise you that COBOL was a programming language. And I was a developer and managed development uh, for C and C++, Linux kernel, user space, and later on joined the cybersecurity industry in different companies. So let's dive into the problem. So there are three phases in the life cycle of a vulnerability. Identifying it, fixing it, and getting the fix to customers. So identifying it, many people talked about that today. If you go downstairs, many people will try to sell you solutions to that problem. And I'm not going to talk about that. It's already been discussed here. Fixing the vulnerability, we've, we're also talking about uh, ways. And there are always two types. If I'll divide them, I can divide them into these two types. It's fixing your own code, because the vulnerab vulnerability is in, in your own code, or in a third party. And here, the problems start. So let's say that we know how to fix it. But if we need to update a dependency in a third party, how many of you are constantly updating to the latest and greatest version? No one. Yeah. OK, what do you use as a third party that you can do it that easily? OK. Yeah, exactly. It's not easy. And in a lot of cases, uh, what we are saying, if it, if it works, don't, don't touch it. Right? This is our standard approach. And then, after we fix, it's a long testing cycle. Because again, it's 
our change and other changes as well. It's not only the fix for that problem. And if it, if it is working, don't break it. So uh, one uh, recent uh, survey shows that although Java 10 and Java 11 are there in the market and are popular, 83% of the developers using Java 8. Right. Oh, no, nothing to say here. I have no words, without words. OK, so let's assume that we've fixed the problem. We have a binary that we can deliver to our customers. And then starts the real problem, and I'll talk mostly about that today. So when you get to production, when you are on the process to production, how many of you found a bug in production after you've done the most intensive tests in-house, you've done beta testing, and you run also acceptance tests at the customer? I can tell you a story about back then when I was uh, uh, responsible for developing a kernel module to, moni to monitor database activity. And we've provided, we've developed a, a, a feature to DB2 users that was asked for a long time. And we've tested that new ability internally. It was great. We went to a beta. The customer was very, very satisfied. We've done exactly what he wanted. And then the first day that he put it in production, it's a kernel model. What happened? His server crashed. And we've done the best testing that we could have done. But after we found the problem and we analyzed that, we, fa we came to find out what we need to do next in order to not fail in this specific one the next time. But it shows us that the best testing that we will do, we can always find something that fails us. As we've talked before, if we are uh, bringing patches which are too big, and in a lot of cases this is what's happening, it brings problems with it. It brings more risk. And two, two examples, the FaceTime uh, uh, vulnerability that some kid identified something like a year ago. I have no clue why it took Apple quite a long time to release it. And it was not only that fix. It was multiple fixes together. Windows Server Specs, for sure. It's, it's a huge patch. You need to wait, and you, you need to uh, uh, have a downtime throughout these updates. And then you also need to download it. And if we are in the world we are going into of IoT devices, bandwidth is also a question here. And you are limited with the bandwidth. And so you will fail in downloading big patches. Here, an example of 33 updates waiting. OK. Sometimes customers need to guess that there is a patch available. How, how many of you have ever upgraded the software or hardware of their router? You did that. Yeah. How many of you did not? OK. Do you know that if you go into the UI, you will see that you'll, you're potentially having a, uh, a firmware update? No one tells us about that. It's that complex and hard. And patches require downtime. And as we've talked before, it is a problem. You're talking with enterprises. My customers were enterprises. We were deploying our solution at their servers. We need to wait for a change window. And it can take a long time getting there. So one of the solutions that in one of the companies that I worked with, we developed was virtual patching. You cannot patch your database. We will provide you an external protection against this uh, uh, vulnerability. But you don't have in, uh, a virtual patch for any vulnerability. You don't know, in some cases, what the vulnerability is exactly about. And so you cannot provide that. And the testing, even at the customer, at all of the environment, can take ages. And so we get to the point that customers are not using the latest patches uh, because they fear that it will break their, their uh, tasks, and they keep on being vulnerable. And we have a great example from 2018, the NHS WannaCry. They were using Windows XP, which was 17 years old. They were already 
new Windows versions that are much better and getting security updates all the time. And so the situation today is that when an update is available, the question is, do we want it or not? If not, then there is no issue. But usually, we want to have it. Are there risks in it? If no, we can update. But most of the time, if I'm a customer and you provide me an update, there is a risk, because I'm used to the level of the patches that you provide. Do we trust the update? Exactly. The answer is usually no. Can we verify the update? If no, we're not updating it. And if yes, a verification. And the verification is heavy. So we have all of these goodies, but we cannot touch them. And if we compare the feature that we want and the acceptance test cost, it's very, it's one to the other. So what is the solution? What I'm going to pr present to you is a vision that we call liquid software. And it talks about continuous updates. What does it mean? It means that we want to get to a point that we are constantly updating the production environment of our customers in small chunks. It's like fl uh, water flowing. It's constantly, flo constantly flowing instead of a track of water that arrives from time to time. Okay. It is a vision. It's not fully baked, but this is something that we are thinking about. And it requires a mindset switch. Same as we had to do before when we moved to Agile. I remember being, uh, uh, thinking that Agile would not work in my project because it's a kernel module. I cannot do that. It's very, very dangerous for that. It's a mindset switch shift. And as, I'm say as I said, not everything is baked. And if someone can do that revolution, it's only one organization. It's the DevSecOps, because it's the combination of the developers, the operations, and security together to come with, with such a solution. So in the next slides, I'll show you some ideas. So first of all, it's not that it's totally uh, science fiction. We have today teams, the elite teams, that are able to deploy changes multiple times a day. Uh, you can say it's, it's only SaaS. And it's us for sure, it's much easier when you have control on the servers in which your product is running. But first, not all of the SaaS solutions are there. It's only the elite teams that are there. And second, we have a lot of non-SaaS solutions. Um, all of the companies that I worked in required an on-prem deployment, required, required a product that is being run on the server of the customer. They were not, did not have a server of their own. So let's talk about some uh, continuous updates patterns. First one is frequent updates. It, I, it repeats all of the problems that we've talked about. Uh, it takes a long time from one patch to another. Uh, a batch update contains a lot of changes and are large in size. And so if we can get to a process that we deliver more frequently smaller patches, it will be more successful. And if we'll get there, we'll create the trust in customers to be able to consume updates over time. The fact that they don't trust it is because they are waiting a long time. There are a lot of changes. And each time it fixes their problem, but introduces three potential others. Another uh, pattern is what we call a canary release. So I'm talking here about the cases that I don't have control over the servers in which it is running. They are owned by our customers. And so I don't want to send an update to all of the customers, especially when it's the first release of this update. I want to choose several canaries, which are, in a lot of cases, customers that we have partnership with and are also giving us visibility into their environment so that we'll see how it's really running in a production system. I can tell you that in one of my previous companies, we had several such customers that allowed us to do that. 
observability. So it is that we want to have more visibility into what's actually happen, happening in our production environments. And the way to do that is to collect data back from our production environments. We sometimes call it call home. We may call it in different ways. But the idea is to constantly get data back. This data can be used for deeper analysis in order to be able to identify what's the normal behavior, what's uh, abnormal behavior, and improve over time. One problem with patches is that, as we talked before, sometimes they may break, even with all of our best testing. And the idea here is to have a local automatic rollback so that I'm keeping the old version and I'm letting the new software run, but I have a mechanism that can identify that it is not working automatically no, without the need for any human being to, to be there. We don't have, like we have in SAS, some people in DevOps that can be looking from behind the scenes and can change stuff fast before the customer is using that, is seeing the problem, but rather we need that in an automatic way. And this is also uh, a need that requires some new way of thinking about how can I, because this is something when I was first introduced into, into that, my, uh, my concern is that if you're using data in a database which is local to the deployment, if you upgraded, you start using a new schema. And this schema, if you now want to roll back, the schema is not being, you cannot use it. And, and old software cannot guess what would be the new schema in a new version. You can always do a, a, a new version of the software can use the old schema, but not the other way around. But luckily today, we have mechanisms, especially with NoSQL databases, where the schema is not that strict as it was before. And even if it's a relational database, there are ways to overcome that. So this is something to take into account. And there are places which are very critical, like software that runs in a car, su such example, where we already know that there is a common practice to run two parallel systems. And so it can be that one of them is getting upgraded and only if everything is working OK, we will upgrade the, the other one. Otherwise, we, we will roll back this one, wh which is broken. Zero downtime is totally important. We want the fixes to be there for customers as soon as possible. Um, you know, I've been talking with, with customers that are complaining about the problem. We provided them the patch. They keep complaining about the problem. We're asking them, did you install the patch? No, we couldn't yet. So it's, it's a problem of the customers, but it's our problem as well. And so the ideas, and I won't get into that here in, in deep detail, is to do the software upgrade in phases of different uh, uh, components. If we're talking about microservices, one that connects to the database and doing the data, data abstra abstraction, we can connect it and it will work still with the old database version and so on. There are ways to do that. And you know, I, we don't have the solution for everything, but we are software engineers and we have a way to solve any problem. And um, uh, having the ability to do the database migration from the old structure to the new structure while the software is running. We don't need to have a downtime to do the database migration. We can do it as the software is running. It's not simple, but it's doable. And above all of these patterns, there is the main pattern that we know from successful DevSecOps and it is to automate everything. We're talking about developing tools that will allow us to do these uh, uh, continuous updates. So there are tools that will run on the customer server, for example, that will take care of doing a rollback, an automatic rollback if needed. 
Everything must be automatic. If it's manual, it's, it won't succeed. This is where we are today. And automation also include as much as possible testing that we can in the security aspect. Um, some other thoughts uh, is to get to a point that we won't need to ask the customer, do you want to update your version? It will be trusted and fully automatic. And we, we, we are there in some cases in our phones. In, in a lot of cases, no one asks us whether we want to update the app. As I was saying, it is a mindset shift or switch. And it requires rethinking by developers. So when you develop a feature, you should think in advance about the ability to do a uh, rolling update of the data, of the schema, uh, to do a rollback. You should develop your software in that version so that it will, it will know how to work with the database of a, of, a of a future version. And also, to do what we want to uh, direct customers to do, we should also constantly update internally, like you're doing, our internal dependencies. It's better to be in the latest and greatest, and then we'll have less vulnerabilities, and the fixes will be for the latest and greatest. If, if there is a vulnerability found in a uh, open source component, the case that they will fix the vulnerability for my old version that I'm using, or if it's a, a third party from another vendor, the case that they will say, yes, we'll update uh, uh, the vulnerability in that old patch is quite low in that old version. It, it, it has a higher probabili probability to happen in the, in the newest version. And someone said a lot of things that we are uh, discussed here throughout this conference were around the thing that we are talking here. I don't remember who it was yesterday, but he mentioned that they are wrapping their uh, dependencies with their own uh, wrapper so that they have a standard API. And if the dependency changes its API, they're not breaking everything. They just need to update the wrapper to use the new API. Some more, if we'll get there, maybe, we could simply push the libraries, the new version of the library, the new version of the dependency down there to the, uh, uh, where we are running our product. Imagine that we will be able to push the, this update of this library, maybe with a wrapper, and not everything that uses that. Even some customers that are running acceptance tests on their environment for the right reasons. They don't trust us. They have special use cases each time that they get a patch from us. They are running it. They are testing it. So maybe we can integrate that into the process so that it is automatic for them, so that we can push updates automatically. It will run on their environment. And if it falls, if it fails, they will simply not deploy that. And we will get a notification about that. As we were saying, uh, as I was saying before, collect more information, a lot of information. We are in the metadata era from every deployment, from everywhere. And then we can process this information using AI for better understanding of what's happening and for incentives, uh, not incentives, and for ideas for how to uh, improve. So. If this vision happens, when an update is available, the question of do we want it is not really relevant. Because if yes, for sure. And if not, it will be automatic. We, don't, we, we will not need to ask this question. Are there any high risks? No. If not, update. But also if yes, the trust in the vendor which be, will be much higher, and it will happen. Um, a lot of the ideas are already, and again, it's a vision, are already described in, in this book that you can uh, get uh, over the internet. 
And with that, I will thank you and we'll be happy to answer any question or rather we can make it a, a brainstorming session of ideas that you have around it. Yeah. Uh, in general, I like the idea, uh, but so my day job is a software tester, and I can see this making things really difficult if they're like, what version does this repro in? And we're doing continuous integration, and all the parts are changing. Uh, mm -hmm. How do you see this interacting with like uh, in-house testing, for example? So, so first of all, again, from my experience, everything should become automatic. And maybe I'll need more clarification about what you're asking, but if you're making everything automatic, the versioning as we, are see them, as we see them today and we're using them would be less relevant. It would be more of the metadata. But customers would not talk about versions. Do you know what version of, uh, what phone do you use? iPhone, Android, iPhone. Do you know what's the version, internal version of your iPhone uh, software? You don't know. Is it really relevant? We think that if we succeed, it won't be relevant for customers. It is relevant internally when we are doing any analysis. Did I manage to understand? Yeah, cool. Yeah. Yeah, I can understand if there are no questions because it's more of a, of a thought process um, that we are all running in and we are trying to push it forward. Okay, thank you guys. Thank you.